you everyone for coming. We're delighted that there's so many of you turned up. Um, just some quick housekeeping. For the forum, uh, the Oxford Forum, we're doing elections next Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the uh, Boyd Room at Hertford College. So submit applications online if you're interested in joining the society and, uh, and go to that room uh, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, I encourage you to apply. Like it's, it's a small society, but that gives us certain advantages. Unlike the union, if you have controversial speakers, uh, you don't you have sort of crowds amassing outside our events because no one really cares about what we do. So you can get away with some quite provocative debates, which is quite fun. Um, so yeah, and a quick clarification about the motion. The motion is, can, athe can atheism justify human rights? Now, Alex's position is actually that athe atheism doesn't have to as a non-position. So he'll actually be arguing that um, he'll be arguing that atheism is compatible with human rights, and um, Sabor will be arguing otherwise. So I'll just introduce. That's awful. Um, I'll just be. In, I'll just introduce the speakers. Uh, Sabor Ahmed is an outreach specialist uh, for a London-based charity, uh, Aira. He's a student of Islamic thought and uh, the philosophy of biology. He has a master's degree in philosophy, uh, and he debates with atheists uh, across the country. He uh, makes videos on science, Darwinism, and Islam. Alex O'Connor is a student here at Oxford with us. He's an extremely popular YouTuber, uh, so go and check out his channel, Cosmic Skeptic. Um, uh, and he, he has discussions with uh, people like, ranging from Richard Dawkins to Matt Delante. So quite a diverse group uh, of people. All of them atheists, obviously. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I'll just, I'll just outline the format of tonight, and then we'll get on with it. Um, so 20 minutes opening statements from each side. We'll start with Alex, um, and then we'll have a 30-minute discussion, and then a 20-minute Q&A. We'll open it up, so get thinking about questions, because it's great to have some audience interaction. Okay, so without further ado, I'll ask Alex O'Connor, otherwise known as a Cosmic Skeptic, to uh, open the debate. Is this sparkling? No, it's not Can sparkling. we have a round of applause for our speakers? Thank you. Are you going to let me know when I've got five minutes left? Can you, uh, can you give me a, a, a three-minute warning? Yeah. Okay, let me know when the time starts as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have to, is, are we doing this? Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here. Um, I think he's just getting a timer up. Thank you to the forum, of course, the Oxford Forum for hosting us. Thank you to the Socratic Society as well, who agreed to move our regular uh, debating session to tomorrow so that they could come and attend this uh, event instead. So we are Okay, well, um, let's just get going. Um, I'm excited to continue this exchange that I've been having with Sabor Online. Anybody who's seen my videos might know that this is a conversation that began online on some YouTube videos. Sabor, not that long ago, put out a video uh, titled Atheists Can't Talk About Human Rights, which, as considering myself a morally serious atheist, so I, it kind of sent a shiver down my spine. Um, and I responded to the video that he made, and we had a bit of a back and forth, and it got a bit tedious, a bit long, and, and we thought there's only really one effective way to settle a YouTube dispute like that. Um, but the guy supplying the boxing ring didn't show up on time. So I suppose a, uh, a debate will have to do instead. And what we're going to be debating is that issue of human rights, what I consider to be one of humanity's proudest achievements, despite its somewhat mixed history and perhaps vague justification. Um, it is true that once the idea of rights were really justified invariably, um, I think someone's trying to get in the door. We're really uh, justified invariably on religious grounding, um, beginning with the kind of with the vague notion of the divine right of kings. Um, but now that we've kind of moved away from that lunacy, and we began by replacing it with the idea of natural rights, with reference to some vague creator, such as the creator of the, that was edited in by Congress to Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. That was what justified those natural li uh, rights before. Finally, and that was that was progress, you know, clawing them away from the elite and moving them to the populace, but before uh, the, the time in between that, finally morphing into the, the broadly secular conception of human rights uh, that we have today. And these include such mandatory ethical baselines as the right to life, the right to freedom, um, and the right to fair trial, and all of these kinds of things. So that's the first thing. The human rights of today, as opposed to its botched forerunners, is grounded in the individual. It's the idea that you have moral worth and protection from those who deny you it, not by virtue of the beneficence of some monarch, uh, not by virtue of a supernatural creator, but by virtue of being a person who is capable of suffering. Uh, to me, the idea, in fact, of ascribing your moral worth and the rights that we derive 
from it necessarily, as, as being necessarily predicated on someone else or something external to the human being uh, is anathema to human rights because the rights are not grounded in the human. But the interesting question is, of course, how do I derive these rights that we're talking about? Right? It may be a dodgy claim at best that these rights come from God, but where else could they possibly come from? Aren't I as an atheist committed to moral subjectivism if I don't believe that there is a moral author um, of, of, the, of the universe that has control over us and over our conduct? Um, do I, it does it not follow from that ethical subjectivism uh, that someone can come along and say, look, it's, within my, it's my subjective preference to violate your human rights, and if ethics is all subjective, then you have no reason, no way to say that I'm wrong if it's all to do with, if, if ethics can just be whatever you desire it subjectively to be. It's a good question, it's an important question, but I feel that it's a misdirected question. First, atheists are not committed to moral subjectivism as far as I'm concerned, as our libraries are overflowing to attest to. But second, even if they were, or even if you think that they are, Subjectivism is a loose term at best and may not, and I believe does not, apply in all areas of morality. Third, where it does apply, its being subjective is not sufficient to show that it's flawed or to show that it's useless. Subjectivism, moral subjectivism, is a real thing with more coherence than I think my opponent would give it credit for. But fourth, and the crux is this, even if ethics is grounded on a subjective-based principle, there are nonetheless objective derivatives that we can get from that principle, and there are circumstances under which an ethical principle being subjective does not mean that two people can simply disagree and both be right, or else have no idea or no way to say who's right and who's wrong. Um, so to begin with, I want to talk about the distinction between, the, I mean, there are at least two conceptions of rights that people generally talk about when they're discussing the issue. The first is the issue of legal rights. The second is moral rights. Now, legal rights, of course, generally rest on the idea of moral rights, but they require a lot less justification. For example, you needn't in law think that human rights actually exist in any way, shape, or form, really. Uh, that is, you, you don't need to think that they are a, a part of the universe, so to speak, to employ them as a concept and to do so justifiably. And to rehash an example I use in one of my videos uh, addressed to Sabor, you can take the legal concept of innocence until proven guilty. Right? This is crucial to a functional legal system, and I don't need to explain to you why. But consider this. Does anyone actually believe that people are actually innocent until the moment that a jury d decides that they're guilty? That's obviously not what's going on, right? We don't actually believe that these people are innocent until proven guilty, but we believe in this as a useful concept to bring about the goal of a stable legal system. It's what Brett Weinstein has described as a metaphorical truth, like going to the gun range. I think that's a, that's a clumsily worded um, uh, label for it, but if you go to the gun range, the gun is always loaded, right? even though you know it's not. It's good to treat it as though it is. And not only that, but we can show that innocence until proven guilty objectively brings about a more functional legal system, objectively leads to less false imprisonment, these kind of things. What it does not tell us is why we should care about justice. Right? It does not tell us why we should want people to be innocent or why we should want them to have fair trial. But given that goal, we can show that objectively, this is the best way to achieve it. Right? It's not a problem, though, because we wouldn't say that innocence until proven guilty is a subjective or an arbitrary principle based on whim alone, just because it doesn't itself directly answer the most fundamental uh, justification of law. Now, this, I think, provides a useful analogy to the moral conception of human rights, which we can now turn to. I deny the following. I deny that human rights exist in the sense that this podium exists, or in the sense that I exist or Sabor exists. Um, but this is not an admission of defeat. After all, who does think of human rights in this way? What would it even look like? They exist a list of rules, somehow not in our nature, but in nature, some, something kind of out there floating around. It, it, it's, it's nonsense, obviously. Um, but that's not to say, oh, well, that, that's not what I believe human rights actually are. They exist in a different and more intelligible way. They exist as a concept and as a method, a mechanism for achieving a moral end, and in my view this moral end is the minimization of suffering. And suffering is a real thing. Now this might sound, ladies and gentlemen, suspiciously wishy-washy, um, but I promise you two things. Firstly, this is the correct way to think about human rights, or at the very least a consistent way, and one in which I can justify human rights. And I also have to say that I think it requires significantly more wishy-washiness to get uh, a conception of human rights based on the precepts of organized religion. But it's not wishy-washy. 
And it's not wishful thinking. I've been accused that I'm saying something like, human rights don't actually exist, but we'll just kind of pretend as though they do, and, and we'll run our society like that. That's not what I'm saying at all. I didn't say that human rights don't exist. I just clarified the way in which they do exist. Um, and that is, as a concept, and as a tool, and I can demonstrate that this is the effective way, or the, the accurate way to think about methods of behavior and conduct. For example, let me ask you a question. Does science exist? Right, well, it seems a silly question, of course it does, but how does it exist? What is it? Right? It's not something that you observe, it's not out there. Right? It exists as a concept, it exists as a method. Right? That's what it is, the scientific method. And it makes sense to call ourselves scientists and to say that we're practicing science, to say that we employ science, and to say that that which flatly contradicts science should be suspect. And I think human rights exist in the same form. Right? They're a method, they're a mechanism we can use to achieve a moral end. And it makes sense for us to talk about the practice of the protection of human rights, to say that we employ human rights, to say that things that flatly contradict human rights are suspect too. Right? And it wouldn't make any sense for someone to come along and say that I'm being inconsistent to call myself a scientist because I don't believe in God. I think the same thing applies here. Now, this is where things might get philosophically interesting. I know, because I know some of you in the audience tonight, that some of you are beginning to get a bit seething, maybe. He's distracting from the important point, right? This isn't what we should be caring about. OK, yeah, fine. Human rights exist as a, as a method by which we can achieve some moral end. But it's the moral end that we're interested in, surely. How do I justify uh, that? Well, of course, this is the important question. Why, why, why would we want the end goal of the minimization of suffering? Right? I can show that human rights bring about that bring about that goal, but why should we want the goal? Why do we want that goal? Well, as I say, I believe that the goal, not only of my ethical, um, ethical considerations, but also all human endeavors or more is, is pleasure, or more specifically, the avoidance of pain. Um, now, I know how it sounds. Pleasure is, pleasure is something of a, of a dirty word. This is the first thing that John Stuart Mill addresses in utilitarianism. He says, look, I know it looks bad. You know? If I say that my ethical worldview is based on on pleasure. If I say this, people get this idea that maybe I'm talking about um, you know, a life that consists in, 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 uh, in, in food and in sex and in music and drinking. And though, admittedly, I do partake in my fair share of these things, that's not the kind of pleasure that I'm talking about at the basis of my ethics. Instead, I'm using a broader, more philosophical definition, and that is uh, in line with Derek Parfit, that says that pleasure is simply, by definition, what is wanted when experienced, and suffering is the opposite, what is not wanted when experienced. Notice this is somewhat tautological. So to ask the question, why do we want the maximize of, maximization of pleasure? Why do we want the minimization of suffering? I think is self-evidence. But again, this isn't a full argument yet, because we're still missing something. Yes, OK, so maybe we want uh, pleasure. Maybe we want the minimization of suffering, but why should we want it? Where's the ethical component of this, the moral dimension? And this, finally, is where I will concede the, uh, the essence of subjectivism that I alluded to earlier. Clearly, nothing is more subjective than the belief that my pleasure is good for me. Um, this may be true, but as I mentioned, this does not condemn our deriving human rights from it to be similarly dismissively Objective, and the first point about this, the first point to make, I think, is that ought implies can. Right? This, is a, this is a truism in uh, moral philosophy. To say that you should do something, that you ought to do it, implies and necessitates that you can actually do it, that you're capable of doing it. And if that's the case, then if the only thing that we can desire is pleasure and the minimization of suffering, then to say that I'm wrong because we ought to be desiring something else as the basis of our ethics is incoherent. Right? Now, of course, this relies on what might be called psychological utilitarianism. Right? And I don't have enough time to defend it here. Um, but essentially, the, the utilitarian, of course, believes that we should maximize pleasure and minimize suffering. I'm not going that far yet, at least not yet. I'm just saying that what we do desire, not what we should, but what we do desire is pleasure and the avoidance of pain. I don't have enough space to justify that here. But remember, I'm only trying to convince you here that my worldview is consistent. Right? You don't need to think that it's right. You just need to think that I can justify these things as an atheist, despite the fact that I don't believe in God. Perhaps it's something Sabor can challenge me on in, this, in the next section or something that someone would like to ask about. I'd be happy to do it. Um, but I also want to talk about something else, and I want to make sure I've got enough time to do so, which is this. If the desire for my pleasure, if the idea that my pleasure is good is a subjective thing, it's a very specific kind of subjective thing. It's a universal subjective. Right? That is to say, it's necessarily shared by everyone in all places 
at all times. And before someone tries to bring up masochists or BDSM or something of that sort, we define these people as people who take pleasure in what other people generally call suffering. They, they're, they're not actually enjoying the suffering. If they enjoy the suffering, it ceases to be suffering as we're defining it. Um, so I think it's something universal. Right? In, fa in fact, this seems to be a, a psychological fact. Now, what does this mean? OK, this, this puts it in a very specific category of subjective and a very useful one, too. Consider an analogy, for example. Let's say we lived in a universe, or imagined a universe, in which it was necessarily true of its inhabitants that everybody's favorite color was blue. Right? Everybody preferred blue, subjectively, but everybody shared it. Right? When faced with decisions about what color to paint the town, right, you can objectively derive with the assumption of the goal of blueness that the color to paint it would be blue. Now, the desire itself is subjective, but because everybody shares it, this isn't a problem, and you can have objective ways to achieve that goal. The thing that we're interested in justifying, of course, is the goal. But once you have that goal, and once we recognize that pleasure is something that we do desire universally, there can be objective ways to get there. And if someone came along and said, no, no, I want to paint the town yellow, I think that's what we should do, right? They would not be entitled to say, this is all subjective. The desire for blueness is subjective. If I want it to be yellow, why is that any more legitimate or less legitimate than your desire for it to be blue? Because they're being internally incoherent. If we're living in a world where they necessarily think that blue is the best color, then I can show them, you think that to paint the town yellow is the thing to achieve our goal here. But I also know that you necessarily think that blue is the preferable color. And I can show objectively that they do not fit together. Right? It's an internal inconsistency. Right? Yes, sure. The, the desire for blueness is subjective, but if they come along and say that they want to paint the town yellow, they are wrong. If they think that that's how to achieve their goal, they are wrong, right? Despite the fact that it's grounded in subjectivism, because it's universally subjective, we can talk in these means. So, the same thing uh, can be true of pleasure, right? We can say that we universally share this subjective compulsion towards pleasure, and if we assume that goal, which we can't not do because it's in our nature, then we can uh, make objective derivatives from it in the same way. Now, the next question you might want to ask is this. If I desire my own pleasure, sure, why should I desire anybody else's? Why should I care about somebody else's pleasure? Right? And there are many, many ways to answer this question. And some of them don't go all of the way. Some of them answer part of the question, but not all of it. But again, I'll give you one example. You might not buy it. I don't know. But as long as it's consistent, then I have you with me. So one way to tackle this question is to make reference to what Peter Singer has called the expanding circle of moral consideration. I know it's something that I think Sabor has, talking, uh, has spoken about in the past. The idea that, uh, for example, if you have two beings, uh, this, this is the question that Peter Singer wishes, wishes to answer. If you have two beings in our evolutionary history, one of which is selfish and one of which is selfless, and the question is, who is more likely to survive? It seems that evolution, natural selection, would select for selfishness. If somebody else is sharing their resources, how could altruism survive in the genetic pool if that person is more likely to die out because they're not looking after themselves, right? Well, a potential answer to this question is that when Richard Dawkins revolutionized biology by popularizing in the 70s the idea of the gene central view of evolution, this might provide us with an answer. Evolution does not work at the level of the individual. It works at the level of the gene. So for example, my brother or my child or my cousin share genes with me. And so it makes evolutionary sense for me to care about their survival prospects and try and allow them to continue surviving because they share my genes, right? Now, would this, this only apply to family? In a sense, because of course, evolutionarily speaking, we are all familiarly connected. Um, but this also explains why I care more, seemingly, when I know that someone is my brother, when I know that someone is my child, versus when I don't. But it also explains, because uh, the second part of this, is that when we were evolving as a species, we were living in smaller groups. And so the likelihood is that whoever you came across was likely to be a family member. And so it makes sense to look out for their well-being, too, so that your genes can promulgate. But if you know that they're your cousin, if you know that they're your brother, then you might care about them more based on that principle. But we have a basic idea of why we should care about essentially anybody that we come across. So this explains not only why I care more about my brother or my cousin than I care about a stranger, but it explains why I would 
bestow upon that stranger too a basic level of ethical consideration, despite perhaps caring about other people more. And that's what we can call human rights. Now, make no mistake, I may not say that this evolutionary account of the origin of morality explains why things are right or wrong. That I, that I can't do. I can't say that because something's evolved in a certain way, that makes this principle correct or that principle wrong. But that's not the question that I'm answering right now. Okay? The question I'm answering right now is why it would make sense if we've evolved in such a way to take pleasure in certain things and pain in other things, and we say that pleasure and pain are, are a potential basis for an ethical framework here, why would I take pleasure in someone else's well-being? Right? This, isn't an, thank you, this isn't an altruistic thing in the traditional sense. Um, it can be, this, this can explain why it would be in my best interest to care about somebody else, right? So even if I, I'm, I'm going off the subjective preference of my own well-being and not the other person, right? It still makes sense, even if just for my own sake, to care about that other person's uh, worth. And it's from that descriptive fact that has no moral, uh, no moral component that we can then derive uh, uh, ideas about morality. But this is just to answer the question of why I would care about them. Now, I'm running out of time here, um, but I think that once we, once we develop reasoning faculties, and I'll, I'll close on this, I think that that is what begins to expand the circle rather than biology doing it for us, and I think that that's what it's continuing to do. We're doing it through reason rather than biology, and on that matter, I feel like secular moralists are leading the way. I resent the fact, for instance, I resent it that one day, surely, religion will do now to something like animal rights, what it uh, will do in the future to animal rights, what it's doing now to human rights. I resent the fact that one day it will try to annex the justification for these things and say, we had it right all along, and if it were not for religion, you'd have no reason or justification to ascribe rights to these animals, even though it were the secular progression of atheist moralists like Peter Singer that led that way. And I don't think we should allow this to happen. Right? I don't think that we should allow them to monopolize uh, the rights of the future as they're trying to m monopolize the rights of today as I see it, I think that human rights are not only possible without religion, but in a broader sense, they may be made possible by the rejection of religion, the rejection of the claim that our worth is contingent on something external to ourselves and contingent upon what someone else decides to bestow upon us. Is, is there anything more anathema to the idea of human rights than that our worth does not exist within us, but on the permission of someone else? We might do well to define human rights as the opposite of this. Right? The history of human rights has often been a history of religious opposition, the right to equal consideration under the law against something like the Islamic doctrine of uh, a woman's testimony in court being worth half that of a man's, the right of homosexuals to live freely and express their love for their partners without clerical interference, the right to life and religious freedom too, which are simultaneously violated uh, by the Islamic doctrine uh, concerning apostasy in a Sharia state. Right. I, think I've, I've, I, I don't think I can have it said seriously that religion provides even the best basis for these kind of rights, let alone the only one. I don't know if there's anybody here who wants to do that, but if they want to stand up and claim that, if they want to make that claim, then I think they need to have something more convincing than a vague assertion that atheists have no grounding or can't really talk about human rights because they won't legitimize a suffering-based worldview as even consistent. But I think that's my time. I now ask the member in opposition to the motion, can atheism justify human rights, to take the platform. Okay. In the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy, first thing I'd like to do is to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Thank uh, Patrick from the Oxford Forum for setting up this discussion, which started online and then now we meet in person. And of course, to thank Alex for participating. Now, what I'd like to do is firstly speak about where do we agree? Now, I had a chat with Alex. We were walking around, you know, um, town trying to grab something to eat and I told him, look, I agree with you on some points that you've critiqued others. For example, he's critiqued Sam Harris, right? Now, Sam Harris has this idea of the moral landscape that he can objective, uh, give an objective basis for morals and base that in science, and then that makes it binding. And he's actually criticized that. So I said, look, you know, I respect that. Why? Because you're trying to come to a more reasonable view, a view which is um, better grounded logically. 
right? And you know, the critique you can actually see online. So where we agree so far is that the way human rights is described by an ethics and morals, and these things are described by the likes of Sam Harris and others, is actually incorrect. And he's trying to come up with a view in which he's not committing the genetic, not genetic, the naturalistic fa fallacy of going from is to ought, but just giving a description and trying to make people philosophically consistent. Now, the question is, why are we discussing human rights and atheism in particular? Why not Buddhism, Hinduism, or something else? Well, it's because atheists posit themselves as champions of human rights, as if there's something within the atheistic worldview which is going to make you more likely to be moral and ethical and believe in human rights. Pick up any book by a new atheist author, uh, watch one of their videos, lectures, talks, you will see them speaking about human rights in a very emotional way, in a very powerful way. And so you'll maybe perhaps start to think to yourself, there must be something within atheism which is leading you to becoming more, or more moral, more ethical. And the first thing to realize is that human rights, as we have them in the world today, are a hangover of Christianity. Now I'm glad Alex already admitted to that. And you can imagine it to be like a house that you move into, and you move into this house, and you realize, look, wow, the furniture and the way it's actually laid out is actually quite useful. And you just start living there. That's what the Western world is like today. It's a remnant of Christianity. And a, a, something I was discussing with him earlier is that new atheists don't give that credit. And I wanted, actually, I asked him to move away from new, new atheism and try and be more balanced. Because you have to give credit where it's due. Christianity is the reason why we have human rights today, as uh, the UN Declaration uh, states them. Now, going back to the Declaration of Independence, here's what it says. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that amongst them are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So it's clear that the people who put together the idea of human rights, they believed in God, they believed these rights to be true, to be self-evident, and these were not to be changed. So these didn't come from a secular worldview. And he also agreed with that, which is fine. However, the problem is, now we can't just be happy in this house which Christianity has left over. We have to actually try and justify it within an atheistic worldview. Now, by justify here, we mean being consistent. Now, I'm going to be putting forward an argument because I want to have a discussion which is very clear and directed and focused, which is how can, if what I'm going to say, if I'm, what I'm going to present is true, how can atheism justify human rights? So my first premise is this. Atheism leads to moral nihilism. Secondly, moral nihilism leads to, uh, sorry, moral nihilism undermines human rights. And the conclusion is atheism undermines human rights. Now, these two premises, I don't think these are going to be very easy to challenge. The reason for this is I'm going to be using content from his channel, what he's already agreed to, and the concepts that he's already subscribed to to try and derive these conclusions. Okay, the first, the first thing to realize is this. If you're an atheist, if you're a naturalist, if you believe that there is no supernatural, what do you have in the world to actually come up with the idea of human rights? Well, you have space, time, energy, matter, and chance. That's all you have. Now, using those Legos, how are you going to build up the idea of rights? Because if all that exists in the world are these things, then morality is not something which is true, like in logic, one plus one is two, or the laws of logic, law of non-contradiction. No, it's something invented. It's something that we just use as a convention. It's not actually true. Now, what's interesting is that some atheist authors, like uh, Yuva Noah Hariri and Sapiens, he admits this, and he says, look, there are no gods in the universe, no nations, no money, no human rights, no laws, and no justice outside the common imagination of human beings. Because according to him, all we have are organs. We don't actually have rights. So birds have not the right to fly. They have wings. That's why they fly. And some birds, because of mutations, they can't fly like ostriches. So he rewrites the American Declaration of Independence in the following way. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men evolve differently, that they were, born with their, with, they were born with certain mutable characteristics, and that among these are life and the pursuit of pleasure. So it's very clear that from an atheistic perspective, there is a lot of difference of opinion. There's a lot of disagreement. There are those who believe it's objective. There's those who believe it's subjective. But either way, there is actually some issues here. Now, what I want to do is this. For the first premise, 
that atheism leads to moral nihilism, I'm going to be using the argument of the philosopher of biology, um, Alex Rosenberg. Now, what's the time? Sorry, because I have 15 minutes left. Can you give me five and three, please? So Alex Rosenberg, what he basically does is this. He gives an argument for, for why moral um, atheism leads to moral nihilism. Now, the first thing he does is he establishes the idea of core morality. Core morality is basically something all human beings agree to. So things like you have the right to what you've earned, don't hurt an innocent person, don't hurt a child, especially your own, so on. However, we have in the world different moral codes. And according to him, the reason why we have different moral codes is that we have different beliefs, but we have the same core morality. Now, this core morality is something which evolved over time. And now, like Alex mentioned, the way that, you know, um, if we just cared about ourselves, in, if we play game theory over time, our, our genes are not, not likely to survive in the environment. And henceforth, if we just uh, keep extrapolating from that, then you start having the expanding circle and people are being more nice to each other. So what he does is he speaks about core morality as an adaptation. And what he says is, is, and he gives a new version of Plato's dilemma. He says, is core morality true, therefore it was selected? Or is it the case that it was selected, therefore it's true? And of course, both of these are absurd. So therefore he concludes that moral nihilism is the only conclusion for an atheist to hold. He says, our core morality isn't true, right, correct, and neither is any other. Nature just seduced us into thinking it's right. It did that because that made core morality work better. Our believing in its truth increases our genetic fitness. Now, what's interesting about this is this is something which Darwin himself noted. Darwin himself noted that if we actually evolved under different environmental conditions, like social insects, we would have a complete different set of morals. So, for example, we would consider, if we evolved under the condition that hive bees actually evolve, we would consider it perfectly normal for a mother to try and kill her fertile daughter. And no one would call that murder. We would just think that's perfectly fine. And what's interesting is uh, Alex mentioned Richard Dawkins uh, that, you know, in terms of uh, the selfish gene idea, popularizing it, and the idea of, uh, he mentioned kin selection, and then you have reciprocal altruism, and you have the expanding circle, and so on and so forth. However, look, that is the nice stuff. I'm going to give you the back end stuff, right? Which is, yes, that's fine. That is the way that we've actually evolved according to the standard Darwinian story, but that isn't necessarily the case if we rewind the trape of life and replay. So for example, when Richard Dawkins was pushed about this, pushed about the idea about what Darwin said, that if we evolved under different environmental conditions, then we would have a different set of morals, he was pushed, look, ultimately your belief that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact that we evolved five fingers rather than six. And he had to admit that. He couldn't actually go past that. So that was my first premise, that atheism leads to moral nihilism. How long do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Moral nihilism undermines human rights. Now, the first premise, I, I can't think of why Alex would disagree with that. And the second premise, actually, this is going to be even more difficult for him to actually deny. Moral nihilism undermines human rights. Now, the first thing is, why are we speaking about human rights and not bacteria rights or mango rights? Well, we're speaking about human rights because we have this religious hangover of the idea of human exceptionalism. Human beings are exceptional. Human beings are different. Human beings are special. We have a soul. We have a moral worth that other things in bi the biological world do not actually have. Now, this idea of human exceptionalism is the basis of human rights, hence human rights. And guess who argues against human exceptionalism, vegan activists, including Alex, who is a very famous vegan activist. So it's going to be very difficult for him to deny this idea of human exceptionalism. In fact, in one of his videos, he was actually speaking out against even the idea of humanism because you're focusing on the human. So with the idea of human exceptionalism out for anybody who subscribes to veganism or vegan rights, then it's going to be very difficult for Alex to challenge this premise. Now, if I right now, if I start cleaning this table, right, with some Dettol or whatever, if I kill bacteria, you're not going to call me a murderer. 
I hope not, anyway. You're not going to call me a murderer. Likewise, if I die of the coronavirus, you're not going to call the virus a murderer. If a lion attacks a deer, you're not going to take the lion and put it into jail. Those are actions which are happening in nature, and we would not give them a moral label, whether it's an insect, an elephant, grass, whatever. However, when a human being attacks another human, kills them, rapes them, mutilates them, we say that is wrong, that's murder, that's rape, that's killing. Why are we making an exception when it comes to humans attacking humans, but not when a human attacks a bacteria, or when a bacteria attacks a human being? Because we subscribe to the idea of human exceptionism, which is again another hangover from Christianity. So therefore, since atheism leads to moral nihilism, and moral nihilism undermines human rights because of human exceptionalism, therefore atheism undermines the idea of human rights. Now look, it doesn't matter how sophisticated and how complicated somebody comes up with an ethical idea. It's irrelevant, totally irrelevant. Because fundamentally, if morality is an adaptation, we could have evolved under different environmental conditions, regardless of whether you believe in Kantian ethics or, uh, you know, like Alex believes in utilitarianism or virtue ethics, ultimately, those are illusory. Michael Roos, who's a Darwinian academic, this is what he says. Morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and our feet, considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something. Es ethics is illusory. So it doesn't actually matter how sophisticated Alex's argument actually sounds, because fundamentally it's no better than another ethical system from an objective perspective. So I'm just going to summarize the argument here. Atheism leads to moral nihilism. Moral nihilism undermines human rights. Atheism un therefore undermines human rights. However, let's look at Alex's argument here, his particular form. Now, his form, what I want you to understand about it is, even if you don't challenge it, it's not binding. It's not something you can reinforce. Now look, Alex is intelligent. He's studying here at Oxford University. However, if we put him in a scenario where he ends up on an uh, island with uh, some primitive people, and there's a solar eclipse, and they decide to kill off 20% of their population. They just decide to do that. Alex cannot enforce human rights. All he can do is try and reason with them try to teach them the philosophical concepts he's learned here. Try to teach them why they're being philosophically inconsistent. But he's assuming there's some hidden assumptions that they value consistency, that they value truth, that they value rationality. In that situation, as intelligent as he is, he's probably just going to get stabbed up and probably served up his meal. The fact is, he's making assumptions about them which he actually holds. This is why... Sam Harris's idea, which he challenged, is in a way better because he would be able to enforce it. Now, even if Alex had an army to enforce human rights on that island, he couldn't actually do it. Now, secondly, Alex said pleasure is a good thing and ple pleasure is what he's trying to maximize and minimize pain. Okay, why pleasure? Why not maximize anxiety? Because from an evolutionary perspective, we evolved not for pleasure, not for anxiety, but those are proximate mechanisms to help us survive and reproduce. So it doesn't actually matter whether we're trying to maximize pleasure or we're trying to maximize anxiety. He needs to give us a relevant difference between pleasure and anxiety. Secondly, another claim that he actually made is that pleasure and pain are not arbitrary. We couldn't have evolved in a different way. This is again problematic because if we rewind the tape of life, and in the words of Stephen Jay Gould, he used the analogy of the VHS, VHS tape, and we replay it, we will end up with a completely different evolutionary trajectory with different set of morals and ethics and values and organs. And whatever ethical system he's come up with, we would not actually have that. We may not even have the pain receptors we have now. We may not even have the concepts of pleasure. We may have some concepts which are way beyond us to even comprehend. We just happen to have these. So there's a misunderstanding here of the way that evolution works. Now, five minutes, okay. Now, another thing that Alex mentioned is Brett Weinstein's idea of metaphorical truths. Now, what I want to do is, I thought this was quite interesting when you mentioned Brett Weinstein, because Brett Weinstein says a lot more than just the idea that, um, you know, uh, of the loaded gun and this idea of metaphorical truth. He's an evolutionary bi uh, psych uh, biologist who actually believes religion is adaptive. And if we take Alex's argument and we not challenge it, we don't actually challenge it, we simply change the variables. 
We take Alex's argument and we change the variables. He's trying to maximize pleasure, right? And you have to be philosophically consistent with your worldview. Well, in that case, according to studies, including the person that you referenced, Brett Weinstein, religion reduces stress, increases life, increases reproductive success, increases social cohesion. Now, we can go over the studies in which belief in God does this thing, makes you less depressed and so uh, um, whatnot. So if we insert that new variable into Alex's argument, then essentially we will have billions of atheists who will overnight become into Jordan Peterson's. They'll pretend as if God exists to maximize pleasure, right? So the fact is that if we use his argument, we come to an absurd conclusion, which is this. If an atheist wants to maximize pleasure and therefore they pretend to believe in human rights as if they do actually exist, then they actually have to pretend as if God exists to also maximize pleasure, but then they, you come to a very weird place where you don't have any atheists left in the world to believe in human rights because they all now believe in God. Three minutes, okay. Now, it's not enough for Alex to show that the belief in God is false in order for him to challenge the argument that I just presented where I changed the variables in his argument. He needs to actually give a relevant difference between the belief in human rights and the belief in God. Because from an evolutionary perspective, truth is not intrinsically valuable. Why is that the case? Well, if we take the naturalistic story correctly, then natural selection has fostered us with lots of false beliefs, including, according to Alex, religion, belief in God. Why have we had this for so long? Well, it has adaptive benefits. So for him to break, break this deadlock, he actually has to give re a relevant difference between the two. Now, the last thing I'd like to mention, and I did mention this to Alex earlier, that you know I didn't want to be harsh on him because I don't consider him to be a new atheist, and I hope he moves away from even sharing platform with those guys. But they have a... Uh, how long do I have? Three minutes? Two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. They have this anti-theist uh, anti convention happening in Brighton, right? Next month. And this I found hilarious because Alex's entire argument is based upon consistency. And Alex is one of the speakers alongside Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss. And they're speaking about human rights issues. Yet the greatest human right violation that is happening on earth right now is not mentioned on the agenda. What an atheist state China is doing to its Muslim population, putting them into concentration camps, giving them, taking away their children, taking away their organs, uh, sterilizing the women, and they're giving them physical, to they're torturing them, and they have uh, this program to remove Islam from the entire society. Millions of people. Reverse the script. Imagine if it was a Muslim state doing that to atheists. You think it wouldn't be on the agenda next month? Where's the consistency here? Okay. So, just to summarize. Atheism leads to moral nihilism. Moral nihilism undermines human rights. Therefore, atheism undermines human rights. My argument is not that a, the atheist argument for human rights is dead in the water. It was never alive to begin with. Everything good I've said is from God. Every mistake is from myself. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for that, Sabor. I see uh, you've been writing furiously, Alex. Have you got anything to pick up on? I mean, yeah, I, I, it's hard to know where to begin. Um, I think I, I, should, I should begin on, on the point about Brett Weinstein believing religion to be adaptive and, and beneficial. I, I'm perfectly aware, I've, I've seen him argue it myself, but as, as in the same way that I might appeal to the, to the Benthamite principle that pain and pleasure are our sovereign masters, even though he may have said that rights are nonsense and, and that natural rights are nonsense on still, I, 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 I can reference a person's um, idea without taking what they're saying wholesale. But also the idea that, you know, on, on this worldview that I'm promoting, if religion is adaptive, which, you know, I don't know if it is, I'm willing to grant it for the sake of discussion, that I'd be committed to a worldview that says that atheists would be continually pretending as though religion exists. I'm wondering if the audience remembers when I, when I, issued a throat clearing that said that that's precisely not what I'm doing with human rights. And I even said by name that I'm not saying that human rights do not exist and we just pretend as though they do, but just clarifying the nature of their existence. So if I take your argument and I input the new variable of God, mm. why would that be incorrect? 
Well, I'm not, I'm not sure it would be, but I'm just arguing that as an atheist, it's coherent to How believe How could in the it be coherent if, if we grant that religion is adaptive, right? Yeah. Belief in God is adaptive. According to your argument, should we, shouldn't we therefore to maximize pleasure believe in God? Oh, forgot. Well, it depends what you, so this is the thing. When we say that the existence of God, when we're discussing whether or not God exists, we are talking about something more metaphysical. We're talking about the actual, we're not talking about the existence of a concept or a method to maximizing pleasure. When we're arguing about the existence of God, we're arguing about whether or not something is true. We're arguing about human rights. We're arguing about a, a method in the concept. I think you misunderstand what I'm trying to do. What I'm doing is I'm taking your argument. Yeah. I'm not challenging it. Mm -hmm. I'm just changing the variables. I see. So, Maximizing pleasure, yeah, right. Belief in God reduces mm. stress, makes you less depressed, and increases reproductive success, and so on. Like Brett Weinstein mentions, then why shouldn't we just pretend as if there is a God just to maximize pleasure? Uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, I'm, I'm I'm not sure I agree with Brett Weinstein on his on his diagnosis there. Um, you, you deny the premise. Deny the premise. You de you deny that religion is adaptive. But well, I, th I think I'm, I'm capable of denying that. I'm just saying that no, that's, I'm just, that, I'm just that's one thing that, that, that can be taken. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know sure. if it's adaptive or not. But also, I think it's a category error that you're making. I don't think that you can swap them in that respect, right? If I talk about human rights as being something which are beneficial to achieving a moral end that does actually exist, mm. I'm not saying that anything that is beneficial to, to believe exists can be placed in there. I'm saying well, that hum human rights is of a specific category, that, that they exist as a concept by definition. That's what they are. That's the nature of a human right. It's a, it's a moral mechanism. It's not something that tangibly exists in the way that a god would. Yeah, I'm not challenging that. I'm saying that's so, fine. So you, can't, so you can't swap them for that no, reason? No, no, no. Right? You see, what you're, what you're doing is this, right? You're misunderstanding what I'm trying to do. I'm simply saying, if we just take the structure of your argument, and we assume, because mm. you, may, you may not agree with it, I have some yeah. studies here we, which we can discuss. If we assume that belief in God does have these adaptive benefits, and it does lead to maximization of pleasure, then why don't we just simply believe in God? I've got no problem with saying, it. if people think that it's going to maximize pleasure to act as though God exists in some vague sense, and so do so for that reason. But then, then, then there'll be no atheists to believe in human rights. Only if it is actually true yeah. that religion is adaptive, yeah. and that these people don't, good, and, the, good, and that these people good, specifically good. So place a value, so this is where and, like and that these people sure. specifically place a value. Sure not on the knowledge of truth. Because so, to, say, to say to someone when talking about human rights that human rights don't tangibly exist, yeah. that's not a problem for them. They're not going to mind that yeah. because that's not what they think human so rights we, are anyway. Made, Whereas made, with religion, I think that if you say, well, look, God is beneficial to you, but doesn't actually exist, I think that's going to be more troublesome to the religious believer. Someone's not going to be able to be, you see, you see, believe in the you same see, way. I'm not making an argument for God. I was just showing, no, I not, yeah. Yeah, I was just showing the, if this premise is, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to discuss now. Mm -hmm. So I could cite studies where there is this um, benefit. Uh, recently Pew put yeah. out this research that belief in God makes you happier and so on and so forth. So if that is granted, then that conclusion is valid. What, what conclusion? The conclusion that we'd have to pretend as if God exists. No, I, no because again, th this, is what, this is what I think that, you, that you're missing here, is that these are two different types of thing, right? Religion, the existence of God are metaphysical truth claims. Yes. Human rights yes, are a moral look, tool. What I'm doing here is I'm only changing the variables in your argument. And but but you're, you're changing them in such a way that, that can't be done, right? Like you, you, can't just, you can't just swap in something that isn't of the same category. Why not? I mean, I, 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 I don't, I mean, I, I, I hope that much okay, would, so be, look, would look, be clear. Look, look. I, do you believe, do you believe, for example, um, you don't believe ontologically morals exist? I mean, what, 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 is that, what do you mean by that? You mean oh, so, as in, do, so is in, in your previous video... You, like talking about human rights or yeah, something, as yeah. in principles existing as something tangible in nature somehow, yeah. then no. No, okay. So for the sake of a better society, mm. we can believe in these morals, mm -hmm. right? But that's not that, that there's not a case of pretending as though they exist even fine, though Fine, 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 fine. For you, right. for you, yeah. right? But what's wrong with us just doing that with God, just to maximize pleasure? Nothing. Nothing. That's the point. Yeah, you can That's do, the point. You it's can nothing. do that if you like. Yeah. But so it, but my point is that you Now, let's carry on one more step. That, th then that would mean there'd be mm. no atheists to believe in human rights because they then end up believing in God. It's not true. Why not? It, b because, again, you're discounting the fact 
that people take pleasure from knowing what's true, or they can't help but want to know what's true. And right. if they know that they're living under a misapprehension, then they can't believe something to be the case. Now, why would this not apply with human rights? This is why the category error is being made. Why can't you turn around and say, well, somebody would say the same thing about human rights. They don't actually exist. But what I'm saying is that when people talk about human rights, they're already talking about something that doesn't exist in that way. So for me to point out, these don't exist in nature. They're not tangible. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make someone go, oh, OK, what now? I guess I'll pretend as though they exist. Right? It's, that's just how they're already thought of. And now I'm showing why I think that they're beneficial. Mm -hmm. Whereas to the religious person, if I say, God doesn't exist in a tangible sense. They're not going to say, well, that's what I believed all along. Yeah, they're going to say, that's but, troublesome uh, uh, again, to me. And, yeah. I take, and, and I cannot live under a misapprehension. Again, you're, and that's you're, what's you're them, misunderstanding that's what's me using this as an argument religious. for God. No, I'm saying that's what's going to prevent an atheist from just becoming religious for the sake of it, because they, they wouldn't be able to convince themselves of a no, misapprehension. No, but people can do that. People can pretend to believe in something to make themselves happier. And people do it all the time. You can't choose what you believe. No, people do this. People come up with these delusions, right, because they want to be happier. So all I was doing was I was trying to show that using your argument, mm. you can come up with this conclusion. You're, you're showing with my argument that if somebody was somehow capable of being able to convince themselves of a proposition that would make them more happy, then they'd have an interest in doing it. I think yes. that that's self-evident, of course. Yeah. But, but what you can't say yeah. is that if people accept my argument, atheists would be going religious wholesale because... Okay. Whereas with human rights, I'm not asking people to delude themselves. I'm just asking them to recognize what human rights actually are as a yep. concept. Okay. To do it with, with religion, so, you'd have to say that they don't exist, but you do just have to pretend as though they are. In other words, you're asking people to believe two sure. contradictory premises so there's a at few the same things time, I want to go which through. not only wouldn't be done, couldn't be done. Sure. So of my first two premises, mm -hmm. um, atheism leads to moral nihilism. Moral nihilism undermines human rights. Yes. And therefore, atheism undermines yep. human rights. Which one of these do you disagree with? Um, I disagree with the atheism leading to moral nihilism. You, you kind of co-opted Plato's Euthyphro dilemma. Um, I didn't. I used well, you Alex didn't Rosenberg's use somebody argument. else doing yep. it. Um, to say, uh, so of course, the traditional <coughs> Euthyphro dilemma being For God. Uh, a, a, an argument ag against uh, morality and God. It, are things good because God commands them, or does God command them because they're good? And if I understand the, the version that you're using, it's is, um, is this moral statement true because it's selected for? Or is it selected for because it's true? Yep. Now, of course, myself, I can't believe that it's selected for because it's true, right? Like, we'd, we'd, we'd agree that that would be nonsensical in my worldview. But we have to be careful here. I can say something like, it is, uh, it is true because it's selected for. In the now, what I mean by this is when I talked about the expanding circle of Peter Singer, I explained why it is that we have certain moral propositions, why it is that we have certain moral desires. I then separately justify why we act in accordance with those desires. So I can say that something would be selected for, right? Or something can be true because it's selected for, like an experience of pleasure, like the ability to experience pleasure and pain. That's something that's selected for. And it becomes true, because it's been selected for, that suffering is an experience. Suffering is something okay, that exists. So From that, we can then reason sure, sure. morally. So what you said there, yeah. I'm just going to use that sure. and change the variables again. Yeah. OK. If we evolved under different environmental conditions and they were selected for, and, like, and I didn't have time to go into deeply yeah. into why Alex Rosenberg denied the second yeah. uh, that it was selected for, therefore it's true. In that case, then killing the elderly mm -hmm. would be selected for, and that would be, according to you, a good thing. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it's like you bring up the, uh, the point put to Richard Dawkins. I, I think you're quoting my friend Justin Brierley yes. there who put that question to him, and I put it to him myself, and, and he has this kind of, well, I guess, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, and, and goes off on some nothing about, about, um, he waffles, yeah. about pleasure and pain. But yeah. here's the thing. I don't think that the thing that has been selected for, that is, an ability to experience pleasure and pain. I don't think that can be different, right? Okay, so that's where I disagreed with you again. And so I gave you the example of Stephen Jay Gould, who gives yeah. the, who gives the uh, Stephen Jay Gould is the evolutionary um, biologist who gives the VHS example that if you replay the tape of mm. life and, um, you, and you, you start again, we would have a complete different set of organs, complete different set of morals, yeah. complete different set of ethics, and so on and so forth. We may not even have the idea of pain and pleasure. But that, but that can't be true. This is, the thing that, this is the thing that's crucial, right? So what you can say is that we'd have evolved in such a way that different things would have been pleasurable and different things would have caused suffering. All you're saying there is but that... But why is it not conceivable that we don't even have the concept of pleasure? Well, I, I'll tell you. The reason being that sentience itself is predicated on a recognition of pleasure and pain. Right. In order to make volitional actions... No, that, that's because you're a sentient being on this evolutionary trajectory. No, no, not true. It's because sentience is the ability to make decisions, the ability to be conscious, yep. the ability to do something of your own volition, in other words, requires you 
to make that decision, requires you to have a choice, requires you, in other words, to have a desire to do something. The, the faculty of desire is incoherent without the concept of the avoidance of suffering for you, and pleasure. For you, do you know why? Because you've evolved on this trajectory. No, 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 th this is a philosophical point. That's fine. It can't, it can't no. be done. I mean, how, how would it be possible, for example? See, well, see this, is, this is the problem with the universe. It's, it's hard to think out of what we're experiencing. From a naturalistic perspective, if you rewind the tape of life and replay it again, we may not even have the concept of pleasure. We may have a different concept entirely. But this is what's wrong. I, I have no problem stepping out of our own experience and saying something. We might have evolved, for instance, um, pe people might have thought that rape was a good thing. Right? This is the point that no, you've I'm, I'm not speaking about that. We're speaking about the pain receptors. Right, sure, but this is the distinction I'm making. Like, sure. Somebody might be able to say that. And I don't think, it sounds problematic, of course, to, to say that people might think rape is okay, but obviously, if all the parties involved in a rape actually want the rape to be occurring, then it's by definition not what we would consider to be immoral rape. It would just become sex, right? So, it, so it's, it would be different in that sense, but morally speaking, it wouldn't be problematic. Now, on the, the, the reason that pain and pleasure is different is because like, the reason that those things are conceivable that the reason you're, you're, you're even able to say that we could have evolved to say that this thing would have, been, would have been good or that thing would have been bad for us or we would have wanted this or wanted that instead is because we have an experience of pleasure and pain and because different things could have evolved to maximize the pain and the suffering. So look, my question but to you... But having pain and suffering is a necessary predicate of having consciousness. For you. You cannot make... Con no, no, not, not, for, not for me, not for you. It is sentience, as if, if defined as the ability to be a conscious agent making volitional decisions. You cannot have that without an experience okay, of pleasure so and pain. The, how you experience the pleasure and pain might be, differently, might be different, but the fact that you have a capacity for pleasure and pain, that has to be there. Why? Because without it, you can't make, you, without, without pleasure and pain, there can be no, the, the concept of desire is incoherent. And without the concept of desire, you can't make volitional action. Okay. And then you're inanimate, and then you're not sentient. Okay, so what I'm trying to understand from you is why do you think mm. it's incoherent that we could have evolved in a way that we do not have even the concept of pleasure? Well, I and at to, the moment, you haven't given me a reason for that. I hate to... I, I feel as though I'm repeating myself, and I, I, I hope that um, perhaps it's because I'm not expressing myself and it is actually worth going over again. What I'm saying is that if we had evolved, let's yep. say, to not have an experience of pleasure and pain, yep. we would not be sentient. According to our definition no, right now. We would be inanimate. According to our definition right now. On that second evolutionary on that second evolutionary trajectory, yeah. call it Evo two, mm -hmm. they may have a different definition of sentience. Maybe or, uh, non sentient beings can't define sentience. We, we have to be careful here. What we're talking about is what that what that other evolutionary trajectory would have brought about, right? And I'm saying that what we are now calling sentience would not have evolved. Not because they wouldn't call it sentience, but because what we're calling sentience, just the, the thing that the word sentience is attaching it to, not the terminology, but the thing itself, that would not have evolved. To, to say that that would not have evolved, that is, would to say, is to say that sentience wouldn't have evolved. Okay, so let, let's make it a bit more simpler. Yeah. Right now, sure. we're here. Yes, we're, we're here with our pleasure, with your philosophical ideas, with, 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 the, with these things. Um, Rewind the tape back, mm -hmm. we would have something different. Now, you're a determinist, but I want to make the argument general against atheism. Not, all, not all atheists right. are uh, determinists. So, um, it's conceivable, yeah. Yeah, it's conceivable. Yeah, yeah sure. perfect. It's conceivable. And so, therefore, we have two trajectories. Yes. Evo 1, Evo 2. Mm -hmm. Why is yours better than this? Better. Yeah. Why is yours, you mean, you mean why morally is, better? Why is yours true and this false? I know. So, th uh, this, is, this is the mistake that's being made. If, assuming on both trajectories, Pain and pleasure as a faculty is evolved. Because for, for, because, for the sake yeah. of this argument, for the sake of this particular yeah, argument, let me just clarify. Argument, yeah? right. Let's just say, for the sake of this yeah. argument, to make it easier for you, mm -hmm. it's evolved. Well, it makes but, it no easier for me. But, but, no, because uh, you're finding it difficult to... No, I'm not finding it difficult. I'm saying it, it, it is incoherent to say that you can have sentient creatures without an experience of pleasure and pain. Or capacity yes, but like I said, they, they may have a different definition of that. No, they, they, there's no they to be talking because, about. Because, look, you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to put yourselves... <laughs> put yourself in the shoe of a different evolutionary trajectory, which is hard to imagine. So let's just make it easier. Two yeah. sets, Evo 1, Evo 2. Mm -hmm. Your particular maximizing pleasure here is leading us to what Alex Rosenberg calls core yeah. morality sure. and a lot of the things that the UN speaks about. Right? Yeah. You want to know why that's better than what, what else? Th could then something been. in which, say, rape is absolutely fine. Yeah, well, this is the thing, right? Well, why why as, is this as, better as than As I've this? already said, on this worldview, if rape is okay, 
that would be because it does not in fact cause the suffering that it does in this universe. And if it did not cause that suffering, then it would not be what we currently call rape. It would just be sex, in which case it would be okay. So I can't say one's better than the other. All yeah, I think, that's the point, that's the point. You can't say one is better than the other. That's yeah, what I was trying to yeah, get to. Reason being, because if we'd have evolved differently to experience different things as suffering, my principle, or the, the, the kind of tautological principle that I put at the basis of this, is that our suffering is a bad thing. And so what you're asking is that in another, in another, okay. in another evolutionary trajectory, yep. if something else caused us suffering, yep. like if something good caused us suffering and something yep. bad caused us pleasure, yep. I'm saying that's incoherent because it would just become good and bad. Okay, they would so, just swap over. So that all... Let's go on for five more minutes and then we'll... Uh, if I can ask a question in return, because I, 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 this isn't an interview here after all, I want to have a, have a, have a conversation. I, wanna, sure. five more, yeah. I can't help but pick you up yeah. on the point you made about human exceptionalism. Yeah, okay, good, good, yeah, because I'm vegan and stuff. Yeah, the vegan, and I can never yeah. pass up an opportunity <laughs> to talk about veganism. Uh, it's the same reason I wear little uh, little Floyd on my lapel here. And that's so. probably why you didn't deny the second premise. Absolutely not. No, I, I want to I wanna talk, talk about this. Um, sure. So just, just remind me, if you will, sure. of, of why, <laughs> why the denial of human exceptionalism. So you deny human exceptionalism? Well, it, the, okay, so this is where we have to be careful. It depends what we mean by human exceptionalism. I agree. When, when, I, when I argue against human exceptionalism, it's because I think that other, other sentient creatures, because this is what I'm grounding morality in, deserve moral consideration for the same, we, same reason we do. It's not to say that they're the same, right? It's not to say that they have all the same characters or the same qualities. It's to say that they deserve consideration, So right? would a lion attacking a deer, mm. would you call that grievous bodily harm? No. You wouldn't, why? Because they don't have moral agency. But that doesn't mean they don't have moral They don't worth. have moral agency, Correct. what do you mean by that? Well, we have to distinguish moral agency from moral worth. If a child, like if a, if a three month old child were to swing and hit somebody, would you blame that child for doing it? No, because it ha doesn't have moral agency, right? But it doesn't mean it doesn't have moral worth. If I tried to hit that child, you'd probably be quite annoyed at me. Right, it so doesn't, are, are it doesn't, you saying animals don't have moral agency? I'm saying they don't have moral agency, or other animals, certain animals. Some say, animals. Because some, some of, the, some of the, the, the great apes potentially have some kind of Yeah, I mean, they like for, torturing for moral each other up. Whatever, whatever it may they be. They have we, that, right? We don't know for sure. So, but, so, but those, so those, those particular scenarios in which you admit they do have moral agency. Well, I don't admit that they do. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying that... Okay, we, you, we, you think they do? No, I'm saying we, we observe altruistic behavior, but we have no reason okay, to, fine. to really believe one way or the other. Would well, what, I am, what I am saying is this. Would, would, you, would you agree with me on this point, at least? You say, you know... It seems somehow incoherent for me to not judge the lion eating the, eating the gazelle, but I'm saying, well, the lion has moral, has, does not have moral agency, but it does have moral worth, so we can extend moral worth to sentient creatures, even while accepting that there are kind of categorical differences between humans and other animals. Is that consistent? No. Why not? Because you're assuming that it doesn't have moral agency. Would you say that a lion has moral agency? Yes. Has moral agency. Yeah. As it, in, has it, the capacity to make moral decisions and be judged for those moral decisions. No, not judged. See, this is not judged, but in, in terms of making moral decisions. So right? you, think, you think the lions can make moral decisions? I think animals do have a capacity for morality. As in, they can, they can make moral decisions? Yeah, they, they can make cruel decisions and good decisions. So lions can do right and wrong actions, morally Yeah, they, they can do some actions which are better than others. Well, this may be a... But better by, better by what standard? By less suffering. Your own standard. Okay, um, well, I guess, look, I'm gonna, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but my, my view is that lions... So, so look, human exceptionalism, let's stick to this, yeah. let's stick to the broad stuff. You disagree with human exceptionalism, right? If by human exceptionalism you mean, you mean the view, which it's generally taken to mean, that human beings are the only people capable of being part of our moral yeah, 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 community, that's then that's absolutely yes. Yeah, that's stuff. But okay, that's not good. to say that other animals are not that's included. That's fine, that's fine. Yeah. So, so, how, how, so, in what way does let, that let, undermine the concept of human okay, rights? Okay, okay, so why human rights? Well, let me give you an example, because that was another interesting point I hope you picked up on. Why would I talk about human rights when obviously I care about other animals too? Human rights are a derivative of animal rights. If someone came up here and was talking about women's rights, right, and you said, but this is ridiculous, this person elsewhere has tried to argue in favor of human rights. So why would you come up here and talk about women's rights? It's totally incoherent. Of course it's not incoherent. I care about animal rights and humans are an animal. Human rights are a derivative No, but you're arguing rights. against human exceptionalism. I'm arguing against human exceptionalism, yeah. yes. And the whole idea of human rights is based on human exceptionalism. Not true. So wh wh why do we call it human rights? I think that all animals have, um, well, well, some, I don't say all animals, of course, but uh, all sentient animals, let's say, uh, have a capacity for moral consideration and which can lead to rights. And I think that humans are one example of such an animal. Any, any incoherent? This is what I'm looking for. What, what is the incoherence with my atheistic worldview and my care for non-human animals and my care for the rights of human animals too? 
Because what you're doing is you're undermining the value of human rights by arguing against human exceptionalism. No, I'm, I'm simply saying that I believe human okay, rights... Okay, so do you believe a deer is equivalent to a human being? No. You don't? Okay, so human exceptionalism. No, human difference, right? I don't believe that a deer is equal That's, to a... I don't believe wait, a deer wait, is equal to a wait, shark, wait. but you wouldn't call that deer exceptionalism. Wait, wait, wait hang, hang on. It's just, it's just a difference, wait, right? Wait, wait, and on, you can on. consider all of them as part of your moral community. And I can say that a deer has different kinds of rights perhaps afforded to it than a shark. For instance, I'm not going to say a deer has the right to swim in the ocean, right? But I can say that my, my care for the rights of a deer and my care for the rights of a shark I, I think and my care for the rights of a human I think are all derivative the, of the same principle. Look, I think you're using rights in the incorrect way here. We're speaking about, you made a distinction when it comes to human worth and deer worth, right? Sure, yeah. And what I'm trying to get to uh -huh. is why, what's the relevant difference here? Well, the relevant difference is, um, for instance, human beings have a capacity to predict the future that deers will not. So you might afford human beings rights that, are, that, that pertain to that, and you wouldn't uh, afford it to a, a deer. So you, let you, me give you, you don't think example. deers have theories of mind? Let me, let, I, I, well, I'm, I'm unconvinced of that, of, of that I think. I don't even, know. even crows have right. theories of mind. But let, let me give you an example. To, wait, wait, to, no, you, I, want, I, want, I, I want to clear this up, I, 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 because I don't want to take up too much time on this. But let, let me give you this example. This might help to, to shed some light on the issue. Um, when we talk about uh, equal consideration morally for yep. women and men, when we talk about women's rights, right, we might say, for example, yep. that it doesn't make any sense to say that we'll give men abortion rights. Right? It makes no sense. Right? But that's, that's not to say that we've got some kind of like female exceptionalism because we're giving them these kind of rights and not to this other. Why would you come and talk about women's rights when you care about human rights? Why would you give no, women certain rights and not other rights? Are you saying there's a difference no, between men no, and women? It's like, yes, but this does not undermine in any way either women's rights or human yeah, rights. Yeah, but there's a category mistake here. None of women, women are human. Yes, and humans are animals. Okay. But you think that they're not exactly equal? No. You I don't mean, think a deer is equal to a human being? In, in the same way that a woman is not literally the same to a man? No, no, no. We're speaking about the life here, right? Yeah. So would you, for example, consider a human being who killed a deer, would you say that a human being should be killed? Killed? No. No, why? Well, I don't think that a human being that kills another human being should be killed. Okay, so would you... Don't think capital punishment so, so is a good what, idea. What would, what would be the punishment for killing a deer? No, oh, I don't know what the punishment would be. But I see what you're trying to say. You're trying, you're, I'm trying to get consistency. You're, ask, you're asking if I care about the deer less than the human. Yes. Yes. Why? Because I, th because I think that there are some morally relevant... No, but, but look, Alex, look, you're making a few, yeah, quick, yeah, no, no. You're making okay, a few okay. quick statements which I completely disagree with. For example, theory of mind. Yeah. Right? Crows have theory of mind. Mm. Why would you think a, th a deer doesn't have a no, theory of mind? When I say predict, I, I mean in terms of like, so for instance, let me give you a, let me give you a more like trivial example. Uh, humans, can, humans can be anxious about their tax returns, whereas a yeah. deer cannot, right? Like, right. Th th it's a trivial example, but it's true. There are, there are certain things that are true of some animals, but not of other animals, which, which afford them certain uh, pains and sufferings which might be more numerous or more uh, intense than other animals. But they all, they all matter in the same way, right? So there are some morally, relevant, uh, some morally relevant differences between a human being and a deer, right, which allow me to say that a deer is worth less than a human being. Because of its capacity for pain? Because of those things which are related to its capacity for pain, yes. If it's, got, if it's got less of a capacity so for pain... So according to that logic, again, I'm yep. going to change the variables here. According to that logic, mm -hmm. if there was an animal which had a great capacity for pain, right? yep. say a super sensitive panda that we uh, discovered in yeah. China, uh, they, then the moral variables would change and that would perhaps maybe work to humans. Yes. I'm just trying to show the absurd conclusions again, of, again, of and your worldview. And, and I'm just uh, absurd. I, I don't think this is absurd at all because you're, you're asking um, to quote... Um, that guy off this morning, you're, you're asking if my grandmother had wheels, would she be a bicycle? Like, <laughs> it's just, if things were different, would they be different? Yes, they would. No problem. So therefore, what's the difference between one worldview and another worldview? I'm sorry, you're, you're going to have to be more specific. Okay. So if one worldview in yeah. which we have evolution yeah. a different trajectory mm. and another evolutionary trajectory, yeah. you couldn't say one is better than another. You couldn't say this is true and this is false. No, but that's not a problem. It is if you're arguing that this is what we should be doing. No, I'm saying that given the way that we have evolved in this evolutionary trajectory, there are certain things we can do to maximize our suffering. Would it be true to, to minimize our suffering? Would it be true in another so, evolutionary oh, trajectory so that those would be the wrong things so to this, do? This is, this sure. Is, this is something I completely But why is that a problem? Uh, look, this is something I, uh, I completely skipped. This is the first challenge I put to you mm. about you ending up on a primitive island yeah. and them not valuing 
consistency and truth and rationality. How yeah. would you deal with that problem? I mean, uh, on the literal point of could I, could I enforce it by reason alone? No, I couldn't because they'd probably stab me in the throat. Yeah, but the it. same would be true. Of, uh, the same would be true of any kind of Christian or Islamic missionary. That no, but the I'm saying here is you have the ability to yeah. save those children. Those 20 percent of the population that's going to be killed. Say you have an army, you still cannot enforce those human rights. All you simply can do is try to reason with them, assuming that they value consistency, mm. they value rationality, they value truth. Yeah, but, this, but is again, a, this is a disanalogy. This and they understand all of your um, you know, philosophical arguments. Yeah, no, no. They don't, well, this is the thing. You don't, need to, you don't need to understand something for it to be true of you, right? No, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying enforceable. Right, but this is a, this is a disanalogy because we, we can ask on the one hand, if we'd have evolved differently to have different kind of characteristics, then uh, would I be able to kind of would I be able to say that things are right and wrong on that, on, on that uh, trajectory? And I'm saying no. And you're saying, but what if we found that thing on a desert island somewhere? And I'm saying that, that wouldn't be the case, right? Because we are in this evolutionary trajectory, right? In this evolutionary trajectory, if there is a human population and somewhere And in a different else, evolutionary trajectory, human, we couldn't say that this yeah. evolutionary trajectory is better than this one. Yeah, but the, the, different, the difference in evolutionary trajectory is not analogous to finding a human population on a desert island because they are still human beings and they'll still have the capacity for pleasure and pain that, that all sentient creatures on this planet do, right? Right. Because we evolved from a common ancestor, which means that they would have the same capacity for pleasure and pain. So it's a, it's a disanalogy. But I, I, okay, I, but how would you save those children? I'm That's scared, I'm I'm scared we're taking up time. I don't, I don't um, know how long we had left, and I want to make sure that we have I time. I think we should open it up to questions now. Because uh, that particular... Look, what I find is that you're mm. waffling a lot, right? You're not getting to the point now. Okay. I'm asking... A ve if, you, if you can answer this, then we'll just move on from here. Can you make it brief? Sure. We can open it up. Sure. <laughs> why do you think they should value the idea of consistency or truth or rationality like you do? Well, I'm not saying that they. I'm not saying that they should. I'm saying that they do value uh, suffering and pleasure in the same way that I do. Yeah, but they don't agree with your argument. They but don't it agree doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't make it any less true, right? How do you? I don't, I don't, it my question is how do you enforce it? My argument is that they care about their suffering, and doing this will minimise their suffering. Uh, it doesn't matter if they agree with me on that. I'm either right or wrong about it. Like wh whether or not they agree with me, whether or not I can convince them of it, has absolutely no bearing on whether it's actually true. No, but true. What, what I'm saying is this is why Sam Harris's view is better, because it's enforceable, it's objective. When your view is imp impotent, because you couldn't actually do anything in that situation. Sure, but, but, and, and, uh, and we'll, we'll close it here, but look, this is, this is a point about not whether my view is right or wrong, but whether or not I'm capable of enforcing it. I don't care if I'm capable of enforcing it. But I, if you, if you can't make, enforce human I'm, rights, I'm trying then to make the it's, case, it's impotent. Ladies and gentlemen, that... Human rights are consistent. It is consistent for me to be an atheist and believe in human rights. Whether or not I can, whether or not I can, uh, uh, whether or not I can enforce them on a desert island, whether or not that would apply in another evolutionary trajectory that we don't currently live in, irrelevant to the point of whether the argument I'm making now in this evolutionary trajectory is true. Right? If the argument is true, then whether or not I can enforce it holds no bearing on that. And the question we're, we're being asked to consider is whether or not it is true that it is consistent. And I hope that you can see that at the very least, even if you disagree with me, that it's consistent. For instance, I would think that a, that a Muslim might be able to accept that a, Christian, that, that a Christian could justify human rights. They might say that Christianity has an ability to justify human rights, even though they think it's wrong, right? Because it's, because it's consistent at the very least. And I, I just asked the same thing of myself. Do you want to make a concluding remark? Well, this is why, and I think this is very important to understand, there's a reason why Sam Harris has actually put his argument in the way that he actually has. Because if human rights are to be taken the way Alex has actually explained, they're impotent. You couldn't actually enforce them. You couldn't actually impose them. You'd simply have to reason with people, and you're going to assume that they value the things that they do, and they understand your particular worldview, and they don't need to. And if that's the case, then human rights are just written on paper, and they don't actually make a real change in the world. OK, we'll leave it there. Um, does, any, does anyone want to ask a question? Hopefully there are some. Okay, can I just quickly ask Alex something? Um, in, in, this, in an ideal world, yeah. would we um, create a justice system subjective to each species um, feeling of pleasure and pain? Um, I mean, depending on exactly what you mean, I, I think so. But the, the argument for animal liberation is one of saying that all pleasures and pain should have equal consideration, right? Now, that, that, yeah. that, that means there will be different ways. There will be, di like, because their suffering and, and pain is experienced and expressed in different ways, there will be different things we'll do. For instance, for each species. Yeah, so, like, for one species, we might say that they need um, a certain amount of space, but another species might not like that amount of space. So, we'll end up treating them differently and having different mm -hmm. rules, different rights, different, different literal rules. But the actual principle that 
we care about your suffering and we're going to do what we can to protect you from suffering, would apply consistently. Do you think that would be possible? Absolutely. Right. We already have libraries filled with um, human justice yeah. system. We would fill an infinite... We, we just need to... Every yeah, we, would be it would be infinitely complex. We would just, we would just come to realise the same thing about animal, uh, a animal ethics as we've uh, come to realise about any other justice issue under the sun. People used to talk about uh, women's justice. They used to talk about racial justice. But we've stopped doing that because we've realised that racial justice is justice. Right? Gender justice is justice. And animal justice is justice. I think. And would you be able to draw a line, say... Where would you draw your line? Would you draw it before bacteria? Before? And the ability to, to feel pleasure and pain. OK. Um, who wants to ask a question? Yes, sir, at the back. Um. Ryan, good to see you. Thank you, thank you. Right, um, here's something I just don't understand, and perhaps you could clarify for me. Um, presumably, a fundamental principle for grinding human rights is that of moral equality. How do you justify the equality of human beings on utilitarianism? And just to clarify my question, um, here's an example. Despite the fact that a comatose patient has neither the, uh, the present capacity nor preference for ple pleasure or pain, she is still a morally equal human being with uh, equal entitlement to human rights, such as the right not to be killed. Yeah, well, I think that the difference between you and me uh, on our consideration of that, of that particular instance of the person in the coma um, would be that you would presumably, from, from uh, discussions I've had with you before, think that the kind of the moral value is is um, is something to do with the kind of human um, integrity or something, right? On the utilitarian framework, this is about a balance of, of, of pleasure and pain, and we have to take into consideration what it would be like to live in a world where we allowed people to treat people in a coma as they like, even if the person in the coma isn't going isn't to suffer from it. We have to consider a, a world in which that would be the norm, or in which we'd normalize that as part of our, as part of our ethical system. And I think that mm -hmm. even for your own sake, you wouldn't want to live in such a world. In other words, the protection of other people's rights, even if they're in a position where they're not benefiting from their rights as, as far as like, uh, their consciousness is concerned, because they're in a coma or something, right? The, the way that we identify a failing society, and one that we would not want to live in, if even just for our own sake, is one that refuses to recognize or violates human rights, right? right? Even if just for our own sake, we say, I don't want to live in a country where that could happen to me. I don't want to live in a situation where that could happen to me. And I think that the same could apply here. But I'd also actually thank you for bringing up the point about something like equality, um, because you're right, like the, the issue of justice requires impartiality, right? And so, I actually would, would wanted, uh, if we'd have had more time during the previous section, to ask essentially the same question of Sabor about whether something like um, impartiality, equality of consideration, exists, right? Because it seems a really strange thing to say that impartiality exists. I mean, what is it? It's not something, again, it's not something tangible. It's not something that, that's out there, right? But if you have a conception of human rights, uh, and even if it's based on a religious worldview, as you say, human rights requires impartiality. And I could say, but does impartiality exist? It's like, well, no, but we've got, this, we've got this principle that we've gotten from God, if you like, of, of human rights, and we recognize that the best tool, or in fact, the, the necessary tool to actually uh, bring that about and respect those rights is impartiality. Now, I could turn around and say, but impartiality isn't something that exists. You know, you've just kind of plucked that out of thin air. That's just subjective and arbitrary. It's like, no, it's objectively the best tool, the only tool, a necessary tool we can use to achieve the end of justice, right? And in the same way that the analogy, uh, the analogy is this, in the same way that the religious person would have to say that about impartiality, I can say that about human rights in general and their relationship to, to suffering, to suffering and, and, and pleasure. But I, I actually think the same question should be directed to Sabor. Like, do you think impartiality exists? Or do, you, or do you grant that it only exists in the same way that I think human rights exist? And if that's the case, am I not entitled to do that? I think, look, Ontologically, as an ontological principle, mm. we believe justice does exist. Right? <coughs> justice is a real thing. Now, it's not, I think Alex is a physicalist here. He's, he's trying to say, okay, how does it physically exist? Right? It doesn't exist like that physically, but it's something true. So, for example, the laws of logic, the law of non contradiction, the law of uh, excluded middle, and law of inference, or whatever, do they exist? Is it true that one plus one is two, regardless of your opinion? Yes, that's true. So that's the way that I'm actually speaking about human rights and justice. Now, when it comes to Alex here, and I, I think this is, this is really confusing about uh, what he's saying here, because in one sense, he's saying 
human rights do not exist. In another sense, he's saying they do actually exist. Now, what it basically is, is the, I think it'll be easier to actually um, uh, sort out this discussion if we speak about this from the perspective of atheism versus theism. Now, from an atheistic perspective, all you have is space, time, matter, energy, and chance. Using those building blocks, how can you come up with the idea of right and wrong and impartiality? You can't. But from a theistic worldview, you have the idea of justice as an ontological principle which is real and true. Alex is saying, but I can't touch it. But again, he, he's got this limited physical idea of, okay, but if, if I can't touch it, it's not there, right? But that's a, that's a very limited, crude way of actually thinking about reality. Now, um, look, something Alex said in his video, I'm going to bring up here, and I, I quoted him directly so that he, he, you know, there's no thing about coal mining. He says, look... Can you keep it brief? Because there are other questions. Yeah, but, you know, he gave him time. Just, I know, but we just, don't want this to descend into another discussion. Sure, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wrapping yeah, up my yeah. point. Okay. So, he says in his video, again, natural selection, it doesn't prove or disprove moral ontology. It says nothing about it. And he says this repeatedly. And I found this very strange because you have philosophers speaking about evolutionary moral realism. You have other philosophers, like I mentioned, Alex Rosenberg, speaking about evolutionary anti-realism, as in uh, moral ontology being false. And he doesn't seem to be aware of those things. And he's just repeating the idea that, look, I can be consistent. But you can be consistent in nonsense. And what I'm trying to show is that his worldview is leading to absurd conclusions such as believing in God, eventually, if we change the variables, and he has no, no way of actually challenging them. So for me, I think what he needs to do is he needs to accept the idea that his conception of human rights being something physical, that's the root of the problem, because the theistic case is not that human rights are something physical and you can actually touch. Okay. Has anyone else got a question? The gentleman at the front on the left. Hi, Alex. Uh, you mentioned consistency being one of your main points. I just have two short questions for you from two of many inconsistencies within your rhetoric. You said human rights to you is a concept to achieve maximize, to maximize pleasure and avoid pain, i.e. get more of what is wanted when experienced. You then tried to challenge Sabur on lines being moral agents. According to your criteria, they are far more advanced at this than you, because they strive a lot more to seek their pleasure and avoid pain. So why are they not moral agents according to your criteria? And secondly, you resent the, external, the idea of an external lawgiver to human beings. So by what criteria do you exalt yourself to being an external lawgiver to the animal kingdom? Thank you. Sure. Um, so on the first point... Um, Moral agency is, is more than just... Th this is precisely the distinction I made a minute ago about moral agency and moral worth. You're absolutely right. Animals are perfectly capable of desiring their pleasures and, and desiring the avoidance of suffering just as we do. Right? The difference between that, which gives them moral worth, and that, in fact, that's what gives them moral worth in the same way that it gives us moral worth, the difference between that and moral agency is the fact that we can reflect on it and make decisions uh, in accordance with what will make those maximizations. Right? Like, you can't have the same kind of... The end goal is the same as yours. Yeah, the end goal is the same. They're which you, the process, yeah, and they're better at it yeah. than you, so they have they're, to be more... Wh when you say better at it, when you say better at it, yes. what, what, what do you mean when you say better at it? You could say that because they don't have the ability to use their intellect to reason, mm. and they are more instinctive, it is easier for them to seek pleasure. They have less distractions, and it's also easier for them to avoid pain. But yet you claim they don't have moral agency. You've contradicted yourself. But again, no, this is, a, this is again, I, I hate to repeat myself, but this is, this is why I clarified at the beginning that when I say pleasure and suffering, I'm not talking about trivial pleasures and suffering. Right? I'm not talking about the ability to just go and have sex with whom you please. But it's all trivial, like. you. No, no, not true. The reason being is because, like, the reason why we have these constraints on our, on our uh, behavior is because we recognize that it achieves a greater good, achieves a greater pleasure, achieves a, a, a further minimization of suffering. Even if in this particular instance, right, I might want to go and do something immoral. I might want to go and do something wrong that causes suffering. Fine. And you could say, well, the lion's better at you than doing that because he'll just go and do it, right? But if I don't do that, if I restrain myself from doing that and institute a rule that stops me from doing that, then overall my suffering will be minimized because I'll live in a society that's more stable and morally coherent. Does, I hope that makes sense. Uh, 
I could, I would like to talk to you maybe some other time about it. Not we can make it happen, sure. You answer the second question, please, about why you, would, you put yourself in the position of an external lawgiver to the lions in the animal kingdom. Yet you said you resent anything outside of human beings being an external lawgiver. This is known as cosmic authority syndrome. Mm. No, so I, I why have, do you exalt yourself to that? I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a lawgiver in the way that... Um, in the way that well, you posited yourself as one. You're in, not getting notice. In the way that, in the way that Sabor <laughs> would, uh, would say that... Uh, no, no, God, no, you said it. Mm. You said you, you were going to champion animal rights. You I didn't, said it, not Sabor or I didn't say that I'm a lawgiver. You heard that I'm a lawgiver. Okay. The religious like to claim that or God... him who follows his own the, desires... The reli- I'm sorry, I, ju- I just can't hear. The, 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 reason, the, the reason why the religious see that God is a lawgiver is because they see him as the author of I these laws. I didn't mention God. Right. These I are, mentioned if, your perception look, of an I, external look, I, lawgiver. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a potted plant here. I, can I respond? Yes, you so, can. Sorry. I... Uh, I'm responding not, to why I didn't I'm say... I'm not a lawgiver. Can we maybe take the microphone? I mean, I, if you want me to respond, I'll respond. Right. The... the um, what was the what, what was I just saying? Someone remind me. <laughs> really? No, it's, it's just I, I'm not okay. I'm not a lawgiver in the same way that God is a law, is a lawgiver, right? The religious claim that God is a lawgiver because they believe he's the author of the moral laws. Uh, humans and if other animals have consideration, other animals have moral worth because I determine it to be so. Because God determines it to be so. That's where it comes from. That's what it's grounded in. I don't say that these animals have worth because I say that they have worth, right? I say that they have worth for other reasons. I'm simply trying to make people recognize that they have that moral worth. I'm not saying this lion has moral worth because I say so, in the way that the religious will claim that a human has rights and moral worth because God says so. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not the author of their moral worth. I'm just trying to make people realize that that moral worth exists for reasons, for reasons external to myself. I think, I, I think I'll leave that up to the audience. Is, is that, does that sufficiently answer the question? Does, that, does anybody else have a quarrel? With, with, with that. Uh, does anybody else interpret me telling people that because animals have a capacity for feeling suffering in the same way that we do, we should extend the moral consideration? Does anybody else interpret that as me saying that I'm a moral lawgiver, that I'm the author of their moral worth? Does anybody else think that that's what I'm saying? Anybody? Any hands? I think it's just what you heard. Let's have a final question. Uh, gentleman at the back in the middle. This question is for Alex. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you. Uh, it was an interesting discussion, and some of your arguments were really, really interesting. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a question about pain and suffering. I'm sure you must be sick of it. <laughs> no apologies, it's uh, fine. Yeah. So, um, would it be justified to consider differences in suffering based upon the implied suffering that is caused? For example, um, there's a rich person, his property is damaged, and he might not uh, suffer as much as a poor person who has been uh, subject to the same level of damage. Would we therefore be required to implement a justice system which is not equal for both individuals, but varies depending on this point, on this points-based system of suffering, as opposed to simply applying a set of punishment based upon damage caused as opposed to the amount of suffering. Hopefully it was clear. Yeah, that's a, it's a fantastic question, actually, because it seems to contradict our idea of, of, of justice that I can say that for the same crime, two people get different punishments just because of the implied suffering. I think that's a fantastic question, right? On the, on the kind of ontological point, on the moral point of this, I think that what you're hitting at is actually correct, right? This is something that Peter Singer talks about quite effectively um, in relation to animals in the sense of, like, Flicking one animal versus flicking another animal um, is kind of is different, not because of what I'm doing, but because of the way it's experienced. Right? For instance, if I were to punch Sabor in the arm or something, right? Uh, it probably wouldn't hurt that much. I mean, I, plant power can only well, get, he's a vegan, can, uh, so only get you so far. Right? I, I think um, <laughs> it would be worse, however, for me to punch a baby, even if I punch them with the same force. Not because of what I'm actually doing, but because of how it's experienced. Right? So on the moral point, I think it's absolutely true that I would be less justified to punch the baby than to punch the boar. And I promise only because of the, the amount of suffering that the baby, not for any other reason, I, I would think that. Um, of course, both would be immoral, right? Now, the question is this. Should we apply this in law? Should we apply this practically, right? Should we then say, therefore, that if somebody uh, suffers, less, uh, suffers less from a home invasion, um, that you know, the punishment is less? Well, I don't think so. 
because we have to consider the practical implications of enshrining that as a law. For instance, what would that do to the economic incentive of people who wish to grow a larger estate? Right? If you have the capability to grow a slightly larger estate, have a bigger house with a nicer garden, but you think to yourself, but if that happens, then when someone comes onto my, onto my property, tries to murder me, tries to steal my property, I'm going to get less legal protection. I probably wouldn't want to do it. Right? So for that reason, I think that we should have a consistent rule, but not because I think that the moral point is actually the same. I do think there is a difference in, in kind of morality between uh, stealing from Jeff Bezos and stealing from someone on, from a homeless person on the street, right? But I think that the law should come down the same on theft, uh, it, like uh, across the board, or be consistent with it for other practical considerations, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, um, just one more question. Uh, guy on the right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just wait for the mic. All right. Um, so I, I just have a, a kind of a technical question. So it, it seems like uh, like Alan's rough position is that it's possible that atheism uh, grounds moral rights. I hope you're not talking about me there. Alan. <laughs> uh, Alex, sorry. Nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, like... Your like favored way of making this work, like it, it doesn't really matter. Just take the resources of atheism and ask whether uh, you know some of those resources can account for uh, moral rights. Let's say it's pleasure, and so really what this view is saying is that uh, b basically that uh, you couldn't have moral rights without pleasure. Um, that's what the view amounts to, and uh, now that's that's like a, a modally charged uh way of putting it um and so if if we buy that step then your position is it could be that uh you couldn't have uh moral rights without pleasure um and now most philosophers uh, and most logicians agree that if something is if it's possible uh that something's impossible then it's impossible okay and so in other words uh if it could be uh, that there couldn't be goodness uh, or moral rights without pleasure, uh, then that just simply implies that there couldn't be goodness without pleasure. Okay? I mean, I know that's yeah. a, a I, long... I mean, I, I, actually, I actually completely agree with you, right? This is, okay. what, this is what I was saying a minute ago. Look, I go further than to say that human rights don't exist without pleasure. I'm saying without pleasure, there is no sentience. There is no conscious right. capacity. There is no morality. Human rights is a derivative of a moral system, sure, but that entire moral system disappears if there's no pleasure in suffering in any possible universe. There is no possible universe in which there is uh, no pleasure in pain and yet sentience. So showing that it's consistent for atheism to uh, make sense of moral rights isn't enough. Uh, you, in order, in order to, to make this claim, like given all the logic, you actually have to show that, it, that you simply couldn't have... Uh, uh, moral rights without pleasure. Which, which I think I've, I've at least tried to do by saying that if, if morality cannot exist, if sentience cannot exist without pleasure and pain, then of course human rights cannot exist without pleasure and pain. It, it, it follows logically, I think. But I know it's, it's was kind of yeah. wanting to say something. Did you want to say something more to conclude? Yeah. So, look, Alex's entire argument is based on the idea of pleasure, right? And he thinks it's not an arbitrary metric. He thinks this is something objective, right? And he's agreeing now, and he said this previously. And what I'm trying to educate him on is actually you've misunderstood the way evolution works here, right? You've completely misunderstood the way evolution works here. Evolution doesn't work the way that it needs to fit in line with my particular pet theory, right? Evolution works in the following way. If we rewind the tape of life and replay it again, we can end up with a completely different set of morals, ethics, values, including our emotions. And we may not even have the idea of pleasure and pain. We may have a completely different set of something else that is hard to conceive. If that's the case, then what Alex is saying right now is completely arbitrary. He doesn't seem to think it's a problem. That's because he's misunderstood the way evolution actually works. And this is what I'm trying to get to. It doesn't matter how sophisticated of an ethic you actually come up with, it is not objectively true. And the, the simple argument that I've been repeating throughout the night, that atheism leads to moral nihilism, and Alex is a moral nihilist. He does believe in moral nihilism. And that moral nihilism 
This is something that you've previously said, unless you change your position. I, I mean... Uh, you are, are you a moral nihilist? <laughs> what do you mean by moral nihilist? Uh, what, okay, what did you mean when you said in your YouTube clips that you're a moral nihilist? Are you talking... So, uh, there were, uh, many, many years ago, I had some discussions with Stephen Woodford, where I was just describing myself as kind of falling into to moral nihilism. Yep. But yeah, I've since changed my mind, as you know, from watching The Good Delusion. Right. So, you, moral nihilism for you is a position that's what? Is it true? Is it false? What is it? That uh, moral statements are meaningless. Meaningless. Perfect. You believe that's the right position? No. So you no, I'm saying, I'm saying I'm not that. Okay, now. okay. So do you believe a particular moral proposition is true objectively? That's not what I said. I said it can be meaningful. Okay. Do you, okay. Is rape wrong? No, but look, okay, look, wait, look, look, what's, look what's being done here. Look what's being done here. I say, I say I'm not a moral nihilist because I don't think that, I don't think that moral language is meaningless. And you say, ah, so no, you think look, it's objectively look, true. Look, you're, you're, no, you're, that's you're, not what look, I say. What you're, you're, you're doing is you're not missing. what I even imply, look, I think. Moral, moral, nihil, uh, moral nihilism yeah. is the idea that morals can be neither true nor false. So I'm just going to ask a simple question to Alex. That's one, that's one version of moral okay, okay, nihilism. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to ask a simple question just to wrap it up. Mm. Is rape wrong objectively, past, present, future, yes or no? Given, uh, yes. You given shouldn't hesitate it's, here. It's an object, why not? Because, oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, so I should, so the, the, base, the base idea of ethics, right, the base idea of doing ethics is that we reevaluate why we believe certain things and see if they're accurate, right? If there is a, a proposition that you believe to be totally true, as I thought, for instance, um, of something like not being a racist, right? If somebody asks me, why are you not a racist? And I immediately say, or, or are you not a racist? And I immediately say, yes, of course I'm not a racist, right? Whereas it pays sometimes, even if it seems ethically obvious, to sit back and think, well, why do I think that? So Am I sure answer? about that? And the answer can lead you to other moral places. Sure, what's the answer? Right? So the answer is this, right? It is objectively true that to allow people to rape morally would not be an achievement of the goal that we all share. That's not the question that's, I asked. That's, that's the objectivity in it. Yeah, but you're answering a question... What you want me to do... What you want you're me to do wait one second. You're answering a question I didn't ask. I asked a very clear question which yeah. everybody, I think, understood here, right? I, I asked, I, is I, rape wrong? Ob is that objectively true? And you're just beating around the bush. But the reason why I have to beat around the bush is because I have to clarify that remember how I said that a base principle can be subjective, but you can have objective derivatives from it? Right. So in terms of the objective derivative from our nature, yes, it is objectively wrong. Yes, is the answer to your question. Based upon the subjective... But you're going to want to turn around then and say, but it's based upon a subjective principle. Yes. Yes, it is. Right? Yes. But that doesn't mean that I can say rape is not objectively wrong. I say that if we agree on this subjective moral principle, which we do, then we can make the objective derivative No, but that would, rape would a rapist agree to that? Of course they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. But again, whether or not someone agrees with me is irrelevant to whether it's correct. But look, look, Alex, this is another jump Alex, that you keep making. Alex, what you're doing is you're building a house on a sandcastle. Yeah. Mm. You are trying to say, look, if if, it, if you ask me the question, I would say it's ro rape is wrong. Yes, it's mm -hmm. wrong objectively. Yeah. But in your case, what you're basically you're, you're, you're doing is you're saying, right, subjectively, mm -hmm. some people may hold this opinion. According to that, then since they all subjectively, no, no, all, all people do hold that opinion, okay, and look, from that we objectively but, derive the, that rape is a rapist wrong. Rapist yeah. doesn't. Of course, doesn't hold that opinion. No, no. A, a rapist does value their pleasure and, and the avoidance yeah, of their they, suffering. Yeah, they value their they pleasure, yeah, they right? right? So it's not wrong for them. Yeah, right. Okay. Because so they're maximizing their pleasure. No, but look again. This is the mistake we're making. I said. I, I remember. No, we're moment, making. Oh, yeah. You're I making said, because this is this is the man going into town and saying, "Let's paint the round yellow, the town yellow." This is what the rapist is doing, right? Just because they're saying it's all subjective. I want this to be yellow. I don't want it to be blue. It's like but you, you are being Alex, inconsistent. You are this, assuming this doesn't work. You, you are wrong. Right? You are incorrect. Even if it's based on a subjective-based principle, yeah, but it is objectively wrong Alex, as your, a derivative your to be saying Your entire argument is based upon the assumption that everybody likes the color blue. That's not true. And in look, no, of look, course that's not true. But by analogy, look, me, by, by like, analogy. me liking the color, me liking yeah. chocolate mm -hmm. or vanilla, yeah. is as arbitrary for Alex mm. as someone committing rape or not committing rape. But it's not as necessarily see, see, true. See, but it's not as necessary. Yeah, it's not as necessary. Do, do you see? So for him, it's just as subjective. Whether you like chocolate vanilla true. I, or, or something else, it's just as subjective when it comes to rape, murder, pillaging, all of these things. And behind all the sophisticated technical jargon and stuff... I'll take that speak, as a compliment. Essentially, <laughs> essentially, what it boils down to is... The same thing which Richard Dawkins admitted to, the idea that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact that we have five fingers rather than six. Simply, it's, it's simply not my position. I hope you can see that that is simply not my position. And we'll leave it there. If we, if we must. But if, if, anybody, if anybody leaves this room... Two minutes from me. Yes. If, 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 if anybody leaves this room thinking that that is an accurate representation of what I think, then you have to come and speak to me afterwards. Okay, it's no, simply no. not the case. Simply not the case. Sorry?
I said to people from the audience and the summary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to do a two minute summary each, but you're, you're free to go if you want to. So, no. So, would you like. Uh, are we doing a, we're doing closing remarks? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are, but everyone, everyone can go if they want. I don't want to keep people if they if they. No, no. Okay, I think well, fine. Look, right, that, that's fine. Fine. Um, Just do it exactly two minutes each. I can never, never deny myself an opportunity to stand at a podium. Um, <laughs> Look, I mean, uh, perhaps this gives me an opportunity, to, uh, an opportunity to clear this up, right? Hesitation on what seems to be an obvious moral issue shouldn't be an indication that there's something wrong with you. It should be an indication that you're giving it serious consideration, right? The reason I bring up something like racism is because when I ask someone, are you a racist? And they say, of course I'm not, right? I want them to stop. I want, I want them to say, why not? I want, think about it. What's the principle that you're justifying that upon? I want you to stop and think, no, why am I not a racist? So that you can apply that moral... Uh, principle that you have consistently, because I believe, for instance, that it will ultimately lead to a rejection of the exploitation of animals, perhaps, right? It might be a useful thing to do. So when someone asks me a question, and I don't answer immediately, I'm just paying the question, the compliment, of taking it seriously, right? Now, as I specified the last time I was stood in this position, I believe that at the basis of ethics is the subjective preference for our well-being, for pleasure, and the avoidance of pain, right? Given that goal, given that shared universal subjective, that we necessarily all share. Is rape objectively wrong? Yes. Right. But I need to clarify that's the case. Because if, if I said, without that clarification, that something is objectively wrong, Savor would be able to say at any point in the future, Alex has said on one instance that ethics is subjective at base. But on this other thing, he wants to be able to say that this thing is objectively true. He wants to be able to say that rape is objectively wrong. But he's contradicting himself because he says ethics is subjective. I'm simply just trying to disallow you the opportunity to do that by clarifying that I'm speaking under very strict moral terms when I say that certain things are objectively wrong or right, right. The objective derivatives that we make from a subjective principle can be objectively legitimate, even if the thing is subjective itself. I just don't want anybody to be able to turn around and misinterpret my position. Not because it will make me look bad. Right? I don't care what you think of me, really. I, I, I genuinely don't. But if somebody thinks, for instance, that I'm contradicting myself, then it means they've misunderstood my position. And if they've misunderstood my position, then I've not expressed myself fully. And I want to make sure that people leave the room recognizing that what I'm saying is that the desire at the basis of ethics is subjective. But the derivatives we have, such as that rape being wrong, and other human rights can be legitimate, can be meaningful, and can be consistent. Right? And I think that those alone, those alone are enough to talk meaningfully and consistently about the rights that I assert for myself and for my friends and for my enemies and for non-human animals too. And thank you. Now, I just wanted to explain why I was contrasting Sam Harris's position with Alex's position. There's a reason why Sam Harris, who's one of the four horsemen, has come up with a moral landscape. There's a reason why he's understood that he needs to make a moral argument which is objectively true. And there's a reason why he wouldn't subscribe to Alex's position. And that is simply because if we take the position for what it is and not challenge the logic, and we look at the assumptions that are there, and we change those assumptions, we will come to absurd conclusions. So Alex's entire argument, why someone like Sam Harris wouldn't accept it, is because if we go to the base level of this subjective idea that we want to maximize pleasure and reduce pain, that is assuming everybody has that same goal. But of course they don't. If we go back to Nazi Germany, and we were to do a poll, and people had this idea of killing Jewish people, they don't have that. They don't share the same base moral ideas. So look, no matter how sophisticated your ethical system is, no matter how flowery it sounds, no matter, no matter how much technical jargon and rhetoric you're going to use, fundamentally it's illusory because it's no better than another system if we had a different evolutionary trajectory. And all of this, all of these con confusions which are actually coming, these are coming because of a misunderstanding of the way that Darwinian evolution actually works, which is why Alex's conclusions here are not peer-reviewed. They're not published. You won't find a single philosopher of biology who would say ethics is not illusory, unless they, of course, are a theist. Because they understand, fundamentally, there is no objective truth to any ethical system, regardless of whether somebody came up with it while they were studying at Oxford, or whether somebody spent years and they actually come up with it. There's no, ob there's no objective difference between the two. So just to summarize my argument, 
Atheism leads to moral nihilism. Moral nihilism undermines human rights. Therefore, atheism undermines human rights. I thank you very much for listening. Um, just, before, just before everyone leaves, can we get a show of hands for either side of the motion? So firstly, can atheism justify human rights? Uh, can it? All those in favour of the proposition. All those in favour of the pro the proposition. Cool. And then all those not in favour of the proposition. Okay, I think the motion passes. So Voila. Thank you. We, we've also just discovered that truth is democratic. <laughs> yeah, which, by the way, those who raise, speak to me afterwards, those who raise their hand, I, whoever, whoever you were. See me after class. Come on. <laughs> Bring it.